Good evening. Good evening. I've already been asked whether or not my sermon's going to have an intermission so we can check on the score of the game. I see that some have exercised the halfback option tonight and only about half of our members return for services this evening. I hope that you do not exercise the quarterback sneak and leave during the sermon or invitation. No, there's no intermission, but... Um, hopefully this will keep your attention long enough and be concise enough that you get something from it and benefit from being here and maybe if you're lucky you'll catch the end of that very important game which we're not going to care about in another year. This is a Pickles comic. This is old Earl. He's asking a question. He says, remember when cell phones were the size of a barn? And his old friend over here says, a barn? Nope. Can't say I remember that. He says, I remember when they were the size of a small suitcase, but not a barn. Earl says, remember when you could exaggerate things a bit to make a point without being taken literally by a wacko? Tonight I want to think with you about the Bible's use of hyperbole. So if you're some of those kids who are still in school and you're still in English and grammar courses, maybe this will be of benefit to you and maybe you can impress your English teacher when you get to school this week, the fact that you learned a fancy word. But it's really not that uh, too difficult or complicated to understand. Hyperbole, if we were to define it, by Marion Webster, they said that hyperbole is simply extravagant exaggeration. Extravagant exaggeration. Sometimes, as we read the scriptures, the scriptures speak to us in figure of language and use figures of speech, and sometimes exaggeration is one of those figures of speech that we find used. Bullinger puts it this way, it says that hyperbole is employed when more is said than is literally meant. Okay. Uh, Dungan says of hyperbole in his book Hermeneutics, which he says this, There need be no rule for the interpretation of the hyperbole, except to keep before the mind the purpose of the author, and the language will interpret itself. It is simply an intensification, like saying that your cell phone used to be as big as a barn. You're exaggerating. You're intensifying the, the, the message there. We need to not use it with any intent to represent the facts in the case. Of course, to make these statements literal, we'll find the Bible guilty of many falsehoods. But when we treat such figures in the Scriptures as we treat them elsewhere, there is no danger of failing to comprehend them. Let's take a look at a few examples of hyperbole in the world that we would perhaps hear or use ourselves. Maybe some ice cream shop would say, Our ice cream cones are a mile high. They're not literally a mile high. It just means they're, they're really big. Or somebody says, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. They probably literally aren't going to eat a horse, but, but you know, you get, the, you get the drift. They're hungry. It's so cold in here, I saw polar bears wearing jackets. And it is kind of chilly in here today. I don't know. How do you feel? I see some of you ladies wearing jackets. A little chilly. Um... I don't see any polar bears wearing jackets, though. Their house is so big, it has its own zip code. Her brain is the size of a pea. I'm not looking at anyone directly. I'm just saying, that might be something that we would say. That fish was so big, here's a fisherman's tail, that I needed extra hands to measure it. I wouldn't eat sushi for all the tea in China. This phone is wrong about a thousand times already today. If Jeff Davidson says that, it could be literally true. But for most other normal people, the phone hasn't wrong a thousand times already today. I'd give my right arm for a piece of that pie. I like pie, but I wouldn't give my right arm for a piece of pie. This knife is so dull, it wouldn't cut through hot butter. Might be dull, but it's probably going to do that. My husband snores louder than a freight train. You guys must have good husbands. 
we know those are those are examples of hyperbole or examples that we might use in everyday language. Well, I'll tell you what, the Bible uses that type of language too. There's Bible examples of hyperbole. Take a look at a few Bible passages with me. Let's just look at a few real quick. It shouldn't be too difficult to understand these. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33. This is after the spies came back with their report. They says, we saw giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They weren't literally grasshoppers. They were like grasshoppers. They're just exaggerating. These people were really big and we felt really small. We don't think we can win this thing. And of course, that's why they're forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they're kind of exaggerating uh, the odds of the situation. Take a look at the way Moses actually states it in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 28. He's going back over in Deuteronomy chapter 1, the rebellion. And he says in verse 28, they ask the question, where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and they're fortified up to heaven. And is that they've got fences that go all the way up to heaven. They're just exaggerating. They don't literally, they're not that fortified. But it's an exaggeration. And we can see it all throughout Scripture in little examples like that, that we can easily understand. We should easily understand. They're just exaggerating the situation. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 49. Verse 49 says, Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea. Now, Joseph probably gathered a lot of grain, but I don't think he had as much grain as the sand throughout all of the seas for the entire world. That's a lot of grain. Uh, they're just exaggerating the idea. It says, until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. Same type of figures of speech are used when it comes to the nation of Israel. They were going to get so large, they were going to be like the sand of the seashore in multitude. Take a look at Genesis 13 and verse 16. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, your descendants also could be numbered. You're just exaggerating the terminology there. In other words, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were going to have a whole lot of descendants. And it was going to get to the point. It was innumerable by man. Judges chapter 7 and in verse 12. Here's another one. It says, The Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in their valley as numerous as locusts. Their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. That's a phrase you see a lot. But it's, it's hyperbole every time. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 5. Another example here. Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. There's another sand in the seashore reference. And then look at Psalm chapter 6. Here's a different one. We'd expect hyperbole. We'd expect exaggeration in books of poetry. And the Psalms are books of poetry. So you'd expect to see some uh, and allow some literary license in those passages. Just as we have figures of speech and poetry, that's what makes poetry interesting. Psalm 6 and verse 6 says, I am weary with my groaning all night. I make my bed swim. I think the bed is literally swimming. I drench my couch with my tears. He's just trying to express the idea that he's in grief. He's been crying. Um, the bed's probably not literally swimming, but it's, it's wet from his crying. And, and he's worn out from his, his grief. He says, my eye waste away because of grief. You ever, you're, you ever cried so much, your eyes were literally dry? They didn't fall out of your head or anything. They didn't waste away. You got to use them the next day. But the idea here is he's been grieving. His eyes have, are worn out from crying. It grows old because of all my enemies, David says. Look at one more. Then we're going to look at the hyperbole of Jesus. John chapter 21 and verse 25. John chapter 21 and verse 25. Here's an example from the New Testament. And John says... In this particular example, he says, There are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's a lot of books. <coughs> He's just exaggerating. John says that Jesus did so many other things, so many other miracles, so many other works that we don't even have recorded, that if the world itself, um, if written, the world itself would not contain the books that should be written. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but today, 
Here's what I want to do with you as we think about the hyperbole of Jesus. I want to look at four times Jesus uses hyperbole and exaggeration where sometimes we misunderstand what he's saying. And we just want to understand what he's saying so we can get the real message. Uh, so we're going to allow Jesus' sayings to provide us with examples of hyperbole that include some practical lessons for our edification. So let's look at the first one here from Matthew chapter 5, verses 29. This one's on your screen. Matthew 5, 29 says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. There have actually been people who have read this passage and say, well, look, Jesus is encouraging self-mutilation here. Jesus is encouraging people to harm and to damage themselves. Jesus is just exaggerating. He's using exaggeration. He's not really telling you to just pluck your eyeball out like, like this guy who's got an eyeball in his hand. He says it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. What's Jesus getting at when he makes this statement here? Well, the lesson Jesus is teaching is not the mutilation of our flesh. After all, when asked a question, can't blind men still lust? The answer is yes. Blind men still lust. Blind men do procreate, don't they? I'm assuming that means that they lust and they have sexual desires. And pulling your eyeballs out isn't going to necessarily solve all of your problems there. Can't men without hands still find a way to steal or still find a way to do wrong? I'm pretty sure that in the history of man that there have been some people who didn't have hands who still did evil physically to others or who still were thieves. The point is this. Here's what Jesus is really getting at. We need to remove things from our lives that lead to sin. And if it's going to help us overcome sin, there may be certain things that we need to remove, that we need to get rid of. I'll give you an illustration, a personal illustration. When I was in high school, I, I became a Christian when I was 15, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I had a language problem when I was in high school. I didn't always use the best of language, struggled with it, and it got a lot worse when I was around my baseball playing friends. They didn't always talk right. Uh, in fact, 100% of them didn't talk right. <laughs> sat in the dugout, they said things that they shouldn't say, and there were times that I'm ashamed to say, I joined in. My senior year, I had made the team, and I was um, about to play. Our first game was about a week away, and I went into my parents' bedroom one night, and I said, Mom and Dad, I realized that it was a bad influence on me. We'd been practicing together for a month. I was giving in to temptation, not using my mouth in a way that a Christian should, and I said, I think I need to quit. I think I need to stop playing. And they were kind of surprised, kind of shocked, because I'd always loved baseball, and I do love baseball. But I went in, and I told them that I needed to quit, and I did. And I went in and told the coach the next day that I was going to quit. Why? Well, my friends who were in music, a lot of them were pretty religious people, and they had clean mouths, and when I was around them, I didn't have a problem with that type of stuff. And it was better for me spiritually to be around them. So I decided I'm just going to spend my last senior year just doing music and having fun in choir, which is what I did. And I think it was better for me spiritually. I needed to get, remove myself from that situation. It wasn't a good influence on me. Sure, maybe I can make excuses. I should have been stronger. should have controlled myself better. But the fact is, when I got myself away from those friends, I acted a lot better. And there are times, sometimes you need to get, maybe it's your friends. What is it that you need to cut out of your life so that you can be more pleasing to God? For some people, maybe it's your computer. Maybe, maybe there's some things on your computer that you look up that you ought not to look up. And I'll tell you, there's not just some people, there's a lot of people that need to just find a way to get the computer out of the life because they're giving in to sin. Pornography is ruining marriages, ruining them having secret conversations on social media platforms like Facebook and other things and through your text messages, ruining some marriages. 
And it may be that phone that you need to get out of your life. You need to maybe remove some app off of your phone. You maybe need to have some type of monitoring taking place. Maybe for you, and maybe it's a boyfriend or girlfriend. Would it be a surprise to say that there are some boyfriends or girlfriends that people have that are bad influences on them? If they're leading you in a negative direction and causing you to sin, Jesus is saying here, you might need to get those people out of your life. You'd be better off spiritually than to keep that person in your life and then go to hell. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's even a family member. There are sometimes we might very well need to cut ourselves off from certain family members who are bad influences on us. And friends, maybe it's certain stores, certain places we go. I mean, maybe if you're somebody who is struggling with something like alcohol, maybe there's certain restaurants that you need to not even go into because it brings up the thought, it brings up the temptation. Maybe you need to spend your time at Steak and Shake and Harvey Hinklemeyer where they don't serve alcohol. And, and there are people who, are, I believe, are in that situation. They can't go into a Chili's or an Applebee's. Just the thought of it triggers that, that lust and that desire and that response and sometimes leads to a downward spiral of trouble. And if you struggle with that and you get yourself around other people who are doing drugs or they're drinking or they're doing things that you know they shouldn't be doing and you know you're tempted by that, it's not going to be long before you start giving into it. What's Jesus saying here? There are some people that you might just need to get out of your life and some places where you need to not go. Maybe it's just having boundaries. And that's, I think, what parents should be doing with their children to, to, to help protect them from harm is we set boundaries up for them. We have things like curfews and we tell them things like don't be alone with your mate in a, in a situation where you could be tempted. We set boundaries and we set borders not because we're trying to lord it over them but we're trying to protect them. We're trying to get them to realize that they need to keep themselves away from sin and temptation. When my wife and I on a diet she she does something that drives me a little bit crazy um she's she just has to anything that is not on the diet she's got to throw it out of the house it's just it's gone but i get it i get it if it's not there you're not tempted by it right and so it's probably a good strategy my strategy is before we go on a diet let me eat all of these things <laughs> and then we'll start I don't want to waste this food. But she's like, no, we're starting now. Let's get it out. Who am I to say she's wrong for doing what she needs to do to accomplish her goals? One action that might seem drastic to you, but it might be totally sensible for the one who's tempted. And it, what we should be doing when other people make these hard decisions, these firm decisions, to do whatever it takes to overcome sins, we should be rejoicing with them for being willing to make these tough decisions. Be happy for them. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, Romans 14 and verse 10 says that we ought not judge our brethren. It says in Romans 14, 10, why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Different people need to make different decisions when it comes. Maybe you can handle your computer just fine. You don't have a problem with it, but other people can. Maybe you can walk into a Chili's just fine, but there's other brethren that can't respect their decisions if they don't need to be going there. The simple lesson that Jesus is teaching is just remove things that lead to sin in this passage. And it's a lesson that we can learn from while he uses this form of figure of speech. Let me notice the second thing with you as Jesus uses hyperbole. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, here's another instance where Jesus uses this type of exaggeration. He says to his disciples here, they're wondering, why couldn't we cast out these demons? And he says, because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I don't think Jesus is literally speaking about moving mountains here. We have no real need to move mountains, do we? Most of us, you know, the mountains are fine where they are. We can go around. Jesus is teaching about the power and importance of faith, the power and importance of prayer. Jesus is letting his disciples know that there are going to be great obstacles 
in our lives as disciples and Christians that we need to overcome, and those obstacles can be overcome in Jesus Christ. When we have temptations through Jesus Christ, we can overcome temptations. When we look at his example, when we look at his instruction, we can overcome temptation. When we have trials in life, those are going to be obstacles for us. It seems that they are very mountainous at times. Uh, when we have these trials, when we're suffering, when we're grieving, when someone's persecuting us, we're going to have tribulations, we're going to have tests in our lives, and we can overcome them. The simple lesson that Jesus is teaching is not about literally moving mountains, it's that God can help overcome obstacles. It's a simple message. And some of his disciples needed to have more faith that God could help them overcome the obstacles they were facing. Let me notice a third one with you. Third example of hyperbole. It's one that you should pr you can probably guess what it is just by looking at this picture here. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's tempting for us to, to try to take this passage and point at the 1%. You know, that's kind of what we're doing politically right now. That 1% of the richest people in America. Look, most people in America are rich compared to the rest of the world. So we all need to make sure we're taking this passage and applying it to ourselves here. The lesson here, though, it's not about camels and it's not about needles. That's just a figure of speech. It's just a way to make the message interesting and memorable. It's a comparison. It's about the real message. It's about how riches can get in the way of godliness. It's about how possessions can sometimes come ahead of Christ's church. Achan let his desire for stuff get in the way of his obedience to God in the destruction of Jericho. It became an obstacle. It became something that got in the way of his faith and his obedience. Elisha's servant Gehazi, when you read the Old Testament, he let greed get in the way when he took Naaman's gifts, despite instructions otherwise from Elisha. And he's punished for it. The rich fool that Jesus talks about in Luke 12, he let his bigger barns get in the way of developing a better relationship with God. You keep on reading down through the Gospel of Luke, and you read about the rich young ruler who had done many things, but he wasn't willing to give what he had to those who were in need, who were poor. So we let that get in the way of his faith. There were two men who were bickering that Jesus speaks to again in another gospel, who are saying, you know, hey, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And Jesus says to them, who made me an arbitrator over you? It's not my job to tell you how to split the inheritance. And then he goes on and speaks to them about the importance of not getting stuck on material things. The judges and priests of the Old Testament, they let the power of a bribe get in the way of true justice for the poor and the widows. So if they were representing someone, the one that was going to get the better end of the deal was the one who was richer, which can be a problem in our court system today. If you're poor, you don't have money, you don't have somebody to represent you, a lot of times you kind of end up on the losing end of the, of the, of the deal if you can't lawyer up with a pretty nice lawyer. Jesus says we can be guilty of letting riches get in the way of truly doing God's will. He said it in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. He says in verse 14, The ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard, they go out, they are choked with cares, choked with riches and pleasures of life. They bring no fruit to maturity. Here are people that they could do a lot of good for the kingdom, but they're too busy working long hours, overseeing big business operations, um, caring about their money, involved in all those things, and they don't have enough time to give to the Lord's work as they need to. It can be a distraction. Ananias and Sapphira, another example of people who are guilty of letting their money come before their honesty in the early days of the church, and they're struck dead for it. How many more examples of money's temptations can be given? You can probably think of more if you really work on it. It's all throughout the scriptures. So Jesus is saying, don't let your money become a stumbling block to you in your faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 6, Paul, as he writes to Timothy, says this in verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain that we can carry nothing out. 
Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. You've got something to wear. You've got something to eat. Be content with that. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Paul isn't saying anything different than what Jesus is saying right here. Paul is saying because some people love money, they leave the faith. Jesus is saying because some people love possessions, it's going to be hard for them to enter into the kingdom of God because they're too interested in their material things and in their money. It is harder, it is, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person into the kingdom of God. It's hard to keep your eye on the prize when you've got your eye on mammon. Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon. You're either going to hate the one or love the other. One last thing that we're going to look at when it comes to Jesus in hyperbole, another camel illustration. It's what he says in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe, mint and dill and cumin, and neglected the weightier matters of the law. Now, what is mint, what is dill, what is cumin? Just little tiny herbs, right? Grow them in a, just a little tiny box outside of your house and you're in your window well. Uh, you can grow these things. Little tiny herbs. And these scribes, these Pharisees, these religious people, they were very careful to take these little tiny herbs and make sure that they split it up into 10%. We're going to go back to God and go back to God's people, priests and the Levites. It says, you did that, but what did you leave undone? Justice. Mercy, faithfulness. You're really good at dividing up your herbs, but you didn't know how to be just with people. You showed partiality to people. You were really good at dividing up your herbs, but you knew nothing about mercy and showing compassion and mercy to those who are less fortunate. You're really good at dividing up your herbs, but you weren't faithful yourself. These, he says, you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And here's what that picture represents. Jesus is being humorous. He's making a point, but he's being humorous. Here's the guy who's got a little gnat in his soup, and he's strained it out. He's got the strainer in his hand, and he's swallowing a camel. How foolish is that? Well, this text isn't about camels. It's not really about gnats. It's about how some people major in minors to the point they miss the majors. And by the way, it's also not saying that the minors don't matter. I want you to see something here. He says, these you ought to have done. Yeah, they, they, there was nothing wrong with them tithing the mint, dill, and cumin. He says, the problem is that you did that and you neglected these three biggies right here. You neglected those things. There's nothing wrong with you straining a gnat out of your soup, is there? You can go ahead and do it. But, you know, if I've got a bowl of soup and I've got a rat in my soup too, I'm not going to strain out the gnat and keep the rat. I want all of it gone. Do all of God's will. That's what Jesus, the point Jesus is making. Let's make sure we're doing all of God's will, not just picking and choosing the parts that please us and bragging about our obedience in some areas while we're neglecting so many others. Colossians 3 and verse 17, Paul puts it this way as he writes to Colossae. He says in verse 17, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do everything the Lord commanded. 2 John 9 and 10. Two more verses there. John, as he writes, he says in verse 9, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You need to be in Christ's doctrine. Don't go beyond it. It's important to do all that he said. James 2 talks about obeying the, the whole law. The simple lesson that Jesus is teaching with this is follow God consistently. It's going to say a lot about you. It's going to, be very, it's going to seem very hypocritical of you. 
if you're pointing out these little flaws that other people have, I mean, here you are, you're telling other people, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use that instrument. Well, you're right. You shouldn't use that instrument in worship to God because it's not commanded in your New Testament. So you're right. But you're, then you're a drunk. I, sorry, but it's going to be hard for you to get the message across to somebody about that when you've got some big problems in your life. Hey, you know what? Uh, tithing, that's not something that is taught in the New Testament. Your church that's teaching tithing, they shouldn't be buying. Well, you're right. And we should be telling people it's right. But then you're cheating on your wife. Sorry, good luck. Good luck getting people to really care about the message you're teaching about these little areas that, uh, that, are, that are important. When you're kind of missing out on some pretty big lessons in life that you need to be obeying. Yeah, okay, we point somebody else's little flaw out. You know, you didn't come on a Sunday night. And yet when they get together with us on Sunday night after church, we're bashing our brethren. We show that we don't love our brethren. we got a love problem. How, how are you going to really get through to somebody who's not coming on a Sunday night when, when they are with you? It's evident you don't love people. You've got bigger problems than just not coming Sunday night if you've got that kind of a problem. Jesus is not saying, don't ignore the minor things. He's saying, make sure that you're consistent in all of God's will if you really want to be effective. The scribes and Pharisees weren't effective. People weren't listening to them anymore. When Jesus came, he practiced what he preached, and that's why they wanted to listen to what he said. The scribes and Pharisees, not so much, and they couldn't get a following. They were so jealous of Jesus when Jesus had multitudes of people wanting to listen to him because he was sincere in what he taught and how he lived. Follow God consistently. That's what the Bible teaches us. There's some instances there of hyperbole. Hopefully you understand the concept better. You understand times where it's used in the Scriptures. Some things in the Scriptures might be hard to understand. 2 Peter 3.16 says, But it doesn't mean we can't understand. It just means we might have to work at it a little bit more. We can read, we can understand, Ephesians 3 says, So let's not be dumber than a box of rocks and be so pig-headed we refuse to obey. That was two examples of hyperbole there. That's the reason why I use that. I'm not trying to put you down. Let's make sure that we're doing all of God's will. If you're subject to an invitation tonight, uh, if you're not a Christian, why are you waiting? Do God's will. You know, what he, you know what he calls you to do. Most of us here in the audience tonight, you're familiar with what the plan of salvation teaches. So why are you waiting? Uh, Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. If there's something that you're not doing right, maybe these lessons have taught you the importance of being sincere, not being hypocritical in your faith, being consistent Christians. If there's something that you need to confess so that you can uh, pluck out that right eye, get that stumbling block away from your life so that we can pray for you and strengthen you so you can overcome those obstacles. Why don't you come while together we stand while we sing.